um, and related effects like assurance um, for the MOD. Uh, and I'm somewhat embarrassed to say that this is actually my first UK pony conference. Um, I've always intended to come, but other things have got in the way. So I'm very grateful to Tom and the team for, uh, for inviting me here um, today and to chair this panel. Um, We've had a lot of fascinating talks this morning in particular, and I was a little bit concerned when I saw that I was scheduled to chair a panel after lunch that everyone would be snoozing off their, uh, their curry and their lunch. But I think we've had a very enlivening session just then to talk about gaming, which is clearly very much uh, of interest at the minute, certainly in UK and with our US partners. So I suspect we're all uh, nicely wide awake after that. We're going to move on to a panel now, which you will have seen in the schedule. We'll really take what are some of these sort of the potentially quite theoretical and conceptual and some might say abstract ideas around deterrence that we talk about quite a lot in great detail. And now we're really going to dive down into some of the specifics, I think, going to look at a region of great interest, we're going to look at South Asia. Now this is definitely not an area of expertise for me, um, so I'm really looking forward to these talks. They're going to cover a range of issues um, in that, in that theatre, in that region. I'm going to touch on AI, strategic communications, escalation. So I think there'll be some real interesting um, issues to look at in terms of how these things pan out in real world situations. So my role will be to play as small a part as possible. I'll keep an eye on the time and we'll do questions all together at the end. So um, without further ado, I'll hand over to Salma. Yeah, Hey, good afternoon, everybody. First of all, I want to thank uh, UK Pony for this opportunity to um, uh, share my research. This research is in, uh, still in progress. So uh, today, this presentation is about to assess the role of media in the crisis between uh, India and Pakistan. The assumption basically is that you know the uh, media communications are really play a really critical uh, role during the crisis, and it becomes more crucial when um, there is a social media in it. So in this context, this presentation will present a comparative analysis of the, the role uh, media played between the two crises between India and Pakistan. The first one was Kargil, and the second one was recent Pulwama crisis that uh, occurred in uh, Feb 2019. In case of Kargil, I've, uh, the focus was on newspapers analysis, the way uh, newspapers projected the uh, crisis, and in case of Pulwama, the focus is on uh, Twitter. Just to introduce the two crises, the Kargil crisis erupted in early May 1999, when a large-scale pa Pakistan-backed uh, intrusion was observed on the Indian side of Kashmir. And after, once uh, the intrusion was detected, India uh, deployed its army and our air forces. And both states fought their first limited war after the overt nuclearization in a very rugged, high-altitude area. The uh, crisis ended with the withdrawal of the Kashmiri Mujahideen and the regulars back uh, behind the LOC. However, during this crisis, the nuclear dimension was actually um, highlighted, but ambiguously. On the other hand, the recent uh, crisis, Pulwama, uh, erupted um, when a disaffected Kashmiri youth killed 40 Indian paramilitary uh, forces in a suicide attack in Indian-held Kashmir. The tensions rapidly uh, escalated between the two countries, and India, uh, for the first time since uh, 1971, deployed multi-role um, aircrafts multi role air force to hit deep inside Pakistan. And the next day's dogfight, in the next day's dogfight, dog Pakistan shot down Indian jets and captured its pilot. The tensions drastically decreased two days later when, India, when Pakistan released an uh, Indian pilot unconditionally. However, in the following week, uh, India uh, uh, deployed its nuclear submarine in the seas, which was detected and thwarted by Pakistan immediately. So both these crises and the media pl platforms that are selected for this research are comparable in some ways. For example, first, that both crises uh, involved actual fighting between the two countries. However, the intensity and the duration was different. Kargil was the first crisis in the new, new media age in India. And Pulwama is the first crisis between two nuclear armed states in a Twitter age. Both crises introduced the new dimensions between India and, pa in India and Pakistan con conflict. Kargil introduced the possibility of the limited war, and Pulwama introduced the possibility of the deep st surgical strikes, both under nuclear overhang. Both crises internationalized Kashmir issue. In Kargil, Pakistan did it, and in, pa in Pulwama, India did it. Now looking at the um, uh, Kargil in newspapers, uh, about, uh, I analyzed about uh, 710 news items uh, taken from the two uh, leading, news, uh, uh, leading international newspapers in both countries. 
uh, from 8th of May till 26th of May. And the analysis, the news items included the news stories, um, editorials, opinions, and letters to the edi uh, editors. I, I uh, categorized this, uh, the phase, uh, the, uh, the whole Cargill crisis into four phases according to the trends that emerged in the newspapers, uh, uh, the news items. And five uh, themes and dimensions were identified while uh, coding the news uh, items, and the coding was ac actually subjective uh, in nature. The first was the military dimension during all these four uh, uh, phases. The military dimension in Indian newspapers was significantly, significantly uh, portrayed, and both negative and uh, positive trends were projected. The ne uh, uh, positive trend involved references about Indian response to uh, intrusion, success, uh, some successes were reported, military restraint, and military readiness. Whereas uh, negative uh, trends were projected explicitly and implicitly uh, about the lack of preparedness of Indian Army for, uh, to deal with the surprise and to deal, handle with the large scale intrusion. However, together these uh, positive and negative trends helped um, create an awareness about military developments in sector, cargo sector, as well as communicated Indian resolve to the intended audience. On the, Kashi on the Pakistani side, which is in the blue, uh, uh, it's the, the news stories initially projected that it was, an, uh, it was a Kashmir uh, freedom struggle, and it was also projected that India violated LOC, uh, to which Pakistani army is uh, defending and responding. However, the, uh, it gradually turned towards negative, uh, more negative in, uh, in phase four when Pakistan had to withdraw. Next was the political dimension that was, uh, that was projected in uh, newspapers. Uh, on domestic political fr front, op opposition in India supported uh, government's um, uh, cargo policy uh, initially, but however, with, uh, from phase two till uh, phase four, there was a lot of criticism on BJP's government uh, policy, and opposition demanded actually that uh, government should come up more open and bring uh, more transparency before public. And the, uh, this criticism generated when uh, the then uh, Defense Minister John Fernandez gave a uh, statement uh, about give, giving about um, safe passages to intruders. On the other hand, in Pakistan, there was a lot of criticism on then Prime Minister's uh, cargo policy, especially uh, towards uh, third and fourth phase when he agreed for withdrawal. <coughs> and um, there was also, uh, the newspapers also highlighted a civil military rift and confusion in Pakistan. On diplomatic front, India succeeded pro projecting its uh, st uh, stance and policy on Kashmir. And Indian newspapers extensively projected the diplomatic uh, success of Pakistan when G8 uh, states explicitly, uh, openly uh, declared this intrusion as an irresponsible act. And uh, when pub uh, US uh, publicly um, supported Indian policy and stance on Kashmir for the first time, and uh, US uh, publicly called Pakistan to withdraw. So uh, comparatively on the, in Pakistan, on diplomatic front there was um, mostly no, uh, not much success. It was mostly a negative trend. However, there were some successes when um, OIC states um, supported Kashmir cause in general. But there was also uh, some success at diplomatic or international level for, on Pakistan side because it, Pakistan successfully internationalized uh, Kashmir and Kashmir became a flashpoint between India and Pakistan. Uh, I will just qu quickly go through the other dimensions. Um, the most important uh, is that the references to the nuclear weapons and the possibility of conflict escalating to that level was meagerly made, and it was primarily uh, generated after the Pakistan uh, issued a statement on 31st of May 1999 that uh, ambiguously hinting at that Pakistan may use any weapon. Uh, and however, there were some opinions and editorials that, calling for, uh, that called for the restraint in uh, uh, nuclear South Asia. Now coming to the uh, Pulwama on Twitter. In post Pulwama, the Twitter became very active in India and Pakistan. So uh, I analyzed about um, 1,430 tweets made by 169 parliamentarians in total on both sides. And that actually shows, the analysis actually shows that politicians use these tweets to actively communicate their uh, the information, their resolve, and emotions to their followers using um, Crisp tweets, hashtags, mentions, and everything. 
and that help actually to stimulate the public mood and um, also to raise and lower and maintain a certain level of uh, temperature. These tweets highlight vivid uh, trends of escalation with few nuclear signposting from Pakistani tweets, from Pakistani side. I divided this crisis into two phases. In first phase, the, from 14th Feb to 19th Feb, during this phase, there was an increased negativity uh, in the Pakistani tweets because it was uh, the uh, incident really ha just happened on 14th of Feb, and uh, that aroused a lot of anger, anxiety, and agitation nationwide with the resolve to avenge that attack. There were some positivity, uh, positive phrases were used in the tweets as well. That was basically to praise the bravery of the soldiers that were died in the uh, incident. However, these both trends, you can see the blue and red line, they plunged uh, 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 downwards to scan negative phrases on till 19th of Feb to help stimulate the Indian public and uh, a nation enough to click and spur an action. Different hashtags and idiom, idiomatic, idiomatic expressions are also used to demonstrate Indian resolve. However, there was a, this hyper, this intensity of the hypernationalism was decreased somehow in, uh, by 16th of Feb when there was a criticism from, uh, made by some parliamentarians uh, which actually criticized the BJP's government. Uh, 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 repressive policy in Kashmir, and they also talked about that it was an India's intelligence failure, why it, uh, the Pulwama incident was not detected or uh, uh, anticipated earlier. However, comparatively, Pakistani tweets initially were more about the Pakistan's uh, uh, cricket super league, which that, uh, that began on 14th of Feb, and they were more excited about the uh, uh, Saudi Crown Prince, uh, upcoming Saudi Crown Prince visit. Uh, only one uh, uh, female politician uh, uh, tweeted with a hashtag Pulwama on 14th of Feb, and later on that momentum gained up and others caught on. However, the, uh, generally uh, uh, on the Pakistani side, the negative trend was, uh, uh, was there, and that actually emerged for uh, negative phrases that were used to criticize India, mm -hmm. knee-jerk reaction to uh, blame Pakistan without any evidence. And they also, uh, there was also criticism about Indians' uh, uh, Kashmir policy. And there was also criticism on India, on BJP especially, that um, BJP is using with Pulwama for its uh, upcoming elections. So that uh, created, uh, that brought a lot of negativity in uh, uh, Pakistani tweets. Overall, Pakistani tweets revealed a threatening posture with uh, references to, with the recurrence re references made uh, like a befitting reply, retaliation to Indian at, uh, attack, uh, this hence raised the emotions of the Pakistans, which led to the demands to India to stop blaming Pakistan for, without any evidence. However, amid this uh, uh, tension environment, the hashtag say no to war emerged once on 18th of Feb, uh, and which reappeared on 26th, 27th of Feb, and then on 1st of March when actual uh, fighting took place. In phase two, from 20, 20th Feb to, uh, till 1st of March, the Indian Twitter was initially very relatively quiet. However, there were uh, tweets that um, expressed a criticism on Pakistan was seen as a litmus test for Indianness, and the daunting phrase "a befitting reply" from Indian from India side echoed on uh, 23rd of uh, Feb, highlighting the resolve that pa India will not hold back. However, you can see that there was a certain drastic increase in the positive phrases. Um, in 20, uh, on 27th, uh, 26th and 27th, when in India hit um, deeply inside Pakistan. And there were, immediately there was a lot of um, pleasure, a lot of positivity on Indian tweets. And at the same time, there was a lot of negativity on Pakistani side. Uh, and at this, on 26th of uh, Feb, Twitter actually helped uh, uh, parliamentarians to communicate to their followers and their, uh, their, um, the public the exact nature and intensity of the uh, Indian strike. What happened actually at Balakot, how many casualties was there and everything. However, the following day Pakistan responded by shooting down Indian jets and ca capturing uh, Indian uh, pilots. That brought a lot of uh, pleasure and a lot of happiness on the Indians, uh, on Pakistani side. And there was a lot of uh, anxiety on the Indian, Indian trees which you can, and they demanded uh, the hashtag uh, the Indian pilot, uh, the name of the Indian pilot was Abhinandan, and there was a massive uh, usage of hashtag welcome, give, them, give him back, 
uh, we need Abhinandan back, hashtags and everything. And that actually, the tension de-escalated immediately on 1st of March when Pakistani, Pakistan released uh, Indian uh, pilot without any condition. And that uh, the tensions drastically reduced on 21st of, uh, on 1st of March. However, there was a, there's an important um, uh, disturbing factor that appeared in Pakistani tweets uh, from 21st of Feb onwards, which is that the adjectives nuclear was used on, uh, from Pakistani side. This nuclear sign posted referred to uh, phrases like nuclear war, nuclear weapons, nuclear South Asia, uh, forcing Pakistan to uh, reply or to, um, uh, to, uh, to, to retaliate with full spectrum. And I, th I believe that this use of disturbing phrases was discomforting, unwanted, and inherently escalatory. Yeah. Just, a, just conclusion, just uh, uh, two lines. Overall, with this uh, comparison, I find that newspapers reporting and opinion were more formal, structured, filtered, whereas tweets, even by parliamentarians who are supposed to be res more responsible on both sides, appear to be less formal, less structured, and unfiltered. So analysis of tweets demonstrate instrumentality of the tweeter in stimulating temperature during crisis that calls for more responsibility, responsible tweeting behavior in the future. Nuclear armed states could develop informal, informally a chain of communication or opt for more structured communication while using Twitter as a platform during crisis. Thank you. Thank you very much. And now, Syed from University of Leicester. Uh, I'm uh, Syed Adnan Athar Bukhari. I'm a visiting PhD candidate at the Department of Politics and International Relations, University of Leicester. Uh, I'm, will, I'm uh, discussing the tactical nuclear weapons and their role in the deterrent stability of South Asia, uh, the India-Pakistan case. Uh, this is part of my ongoing PhD research and uh, I will be discussing that uh, how the TNWs have uh, uh, played their role in the uh, data stability of South Asia. So first we, uh, we define that uh, what constitute, what, what is the difference between a strategic weapon and a tactical weapon or non-strategic weapon. So the tactical nuclear weapons are of the smaller yield and they have the smaller range. Whereas the uh, strategic weapons, they have the, they have uh, higher yield and longer range. Coming on to India and Pakistani case, Pakistan tested its uh, uh, short-range missile Nasser in 2011, and it was uh, extended to 70 kilometers in 2017. Uh, besides that, Pakistan has also developed uh, sh other short-range missiles, uh, for example, 200 kilometer. Abdali, 300 kilometer Ghaznavi, 700 kilometer Babur, 450 kilometer air launched cruise missile uh, Rad, uh, 450 kilometer range submarine launched cruise missile uh, Babur 3. And uh, uh, with the launch of the uh, or the development of the tactical nuclear weapon, Pakistan has developed or you can say it, it has uh, given a policy framework uh, to its uh, non strategic weapon and it has upgraded its nuclear doctrine and uh, it says that it has now adopting the full spectrum deterrence in line with the credible minimum deterrence. Coming on to the Indian side, India has also developed uh, the non-strategic weapons. Uh, it has developed Prahar missile with a range of 150 kilometer to 300 kilometer in the same year in 2011. Besides that, uh, India has also developed other short-range uh, missiles, including the 700 kilometer Nirbhai, that was extended to 1,000 kilometers, 290 kilometer Brahmos, ship-launched nuclear-capable ballistic missile Dhanush with a range of 400 kilometer, and the K-15 Sakarika submarine-launched ballistic missile with a range of 700 kilometers. Amongst these missiles, Pakistan's uh, Nasser and India's Prahar can be taken as the uh, tactical or the non-strategic weapons in India-Pakistan case, uh, being their uh, lower yield and the shorter range. However, other short-range short missiles can also serve the tactical purposes of both states' nuclear policies. So, uh, the next phase of my presentation is the origin of the limited war. 
Uh, once uh, India and Pakistan conducted their nuclear tests in 1998, there was hope that there, uh, there would be peace and stability in the region. But uh, the next year, uh, 1999, the Kargil happened, as Dr. Sama uh, highlighted. And on the next year, Pakistan and India also engaged in another crisis that was known as the India-Pakistan border standoff when in December 2001 there was a terrorist activity in Indian uh, parliament and India mobilized most of its uh, forces on the India-Pakistan border and that crisis uh, remained up till about 10 months when India uh, put its forces on the India-Pakistan border. Uh, but the deterrence and the United States, uh, U.S. mediation played the role in uh, averting these two crises the 1999 Kargil and 2001-2 border standoff. But India was uh, thinking of uh, a new strategy, new war planning that was aimed at a limited war against Pakistan. Uh, and it uh, began uh, uh, formulating such strategy with the name of the Cold Star Doctrine in, 2000, in 2004. So the policy was initiated in 2004 and uh, India was, Indian military was planning this kind of strategy to uh, engage or launch a limited war against Pakistan under the nuclear overhang. And the planning of that strategy is that India, Indian forces with their uh, eight integrated division side for, uh, battle groups, they will come into Pakistan, capture about 50 to 80 kilometers of the territory within three to four days under the nuclear overhang. So that was the Indian planning, and for that matter, India also conducted 10 military exercises from 2004 to 2010. And in 2015, India also conducted another uh, military exercise. So this is uh, the map where uh, India has uh, conducted its uh, uh, military exercises. In 2011, as, uh, as I've highlighted, that uh, Pakistan developed the Nasser missile, and it was basically aimed at deterring the Indian conventional aggression against Pakistan. So it was, uh, there was uh, uh, apprehending the India's war planning, Pakistan took two, uh, took two steps uh, for uh, this kind of strategy, the proactive strategy or the cold star doctrine. The first was the conventional uh, response, that was the military exercise which Pakistan conducted in 2011, known as the azm no uh, So the military exercises were conduct conducted in Sialkot, Cholistan, and Sindh, the key areas for possible war with India, and then the development of Nasser, Nasser missile, the Hataf 9, in 2011, the nuclear-tipped battlefield missile to deter rapid thrust by the Indian Army. In 2013, Pakistan claimed to have adopted a full-spectrum deterrence that was similar to the NATO's flexible response strategy in the uh, 1960s. So NATO, under that uh, strategy, uh, it was the aim of the NATO's flexible response strategy was to deter the Soviet aggression in Europe. And similar strategy we are adopting in, uh, in, in South Asian case, that is to deter the Indian aggression. So Pakistan's development of the Nasser plugged the gap between the strategic and the conventional war fighting. It has deterred the Indian Cold Star doctrine by lowering, lowering the nuclear threshold. But there are certain challenges ahead. Uh, as Pakistan has offset the Indian Cold Star doctrine, India came up with a new strategy or uh, making a new alignment in its nuclear policy making. Uh, for example, India declared its uh, joint military doctrine in 2017. The doctrine says that the uh, conduct of future warfare will include combination of conventional and unconventional, lethal and non-lethal, and military and non-military actions and op uh, operations. So one of the options of this doctrine also includes the surgical strike. In 2016, in September, India claimed to have uh, uh, done the surgical strike, but Pakistan do not claim that, uh, do not accept that claim. But in 20, 2019, Pulwama crisis, India did that uh, by, uh, by sending its uh, aerial uh, component of the forces into Pakistan, and that was reflect, reflected in the uh, 2019 Pulwama Balakot aerial dogfight. So there are serious debates in India of uh, changing its uh, 
no first use policy and dreading a preemptive counterforce strike against Pakistan. And for that matter, there has been serious calls in India that uh, India should it abandon its uh, no first use policy and it should have a counterforce uh, uh, counter force targeting against Pakistani nuclear forces. So that are very perilous for the uh, debt and stability. And for that matter, India is also developing the ballistic missile defense system and launched a sophisticated satellite uh, into space. India's, my conclusion is that India's limited war planning or counter force strategy pose threats for the debt and stability because escalation in a limited conflict is dangerous for uh, both India and Pakistan because both these states now possess the tactical nuclear weapons. Thank you. Thank you very much. We'll now introduce Sam Guthrie, who's a colleague of mine from DSTL. Good afternoon. I'd like to begin with the caveat that the views expressed in this presentation are purely my own and not representative of those of the Ministry of Defence. So, um, aha, here we go. Why artificial intelligence and why am I interested in the application of this to nuclear operations? As Dr. Johnson expressed earlier, the effect brought about by artificial intelligence isn't necessarily new. It's able to pull together different data streams and process them very quickly. But this is something that's been emerging during the Cold War on the American side and so forth. But the effect of being able to find your opponent, track their forces in real time, and some of the other applications. It doesn't necessarily need to be feasible, again as expressed by Dr. Johnson, but merely the credibility of the technology, as long as the technology itself could occur, um, this has implications for strategic stability. Picture in the top right, Ronald Reagan's strategic defense initiative, Star Wars. Even the notion that ballistic missiles could be intercepted was enough to alter Soviet decision making. So what are some of the practical utilizations of artificial intelligence when it comes to nuclear operations? Artificial intelligence can self-improve. It can work through a data set um, and based on its findings from that data set, again, cycle through and gradually improve its findings. It can perceive, including in the optical realm, it can look through satellite imagery and pick things out that a human analyst would use their eyes to spot. It can notify the system operators, those intelligence analysts. It can flag up unusual patterns to them, such as a nuclear weapon leaving its hardened storage facility. It can suggest potential courses of action based off of the learning that it can do. And it's more effective at automation than older technologies. There's been some reference to an arms race in the field of artificial intelligence, and this could hold true as well for nuclear operations. China, for example, has expressed an interest in intelligence automation when it comes to tracking systems. And the US, as leaked by Reuters, has multiple classified programs going on at the Pentagon looking into the application of AI to tracking nuclear systems one could envisage in North Korea. Russia, in its published doctrine, has recognized that it would like to work on decision support for its strategic missile forces. And India and Pakistan, I'll come back to later. The image in the bottom right is an image produced by a university in the United States, which used the machine learning algorithm to identify Chinese air defense sites um, around Beijing, I think. And it was able to do so with around 98% accuracy. The issue here for nuclear systems is that for a country with around 100 nuclear weapons, 98% accuracy could be quite drastic. Why India and Pakistan? The strategic relationships themselves are interesting, and the balance of strategic stability that could be altered by artificial intelligence would have knock-on effects into other areas. There are Indian concerns in regards to conventional balance with China and with Pakistan, Pakistan concerns against India, US and Chinese competition, including an artificial intelligence, Sino-Pakistani cooperation and Indo-American cooperation, for example, on missile defense. 
There are also compounding factors in the nuclear realm, things like the limited economy of Pakistan and arguably India when it comes to nuclear systems, the geography of the region, shallow oceans, narrow corridors of land, their respective doctrines, Indian no first use, for example, the politics and other constraints, such as the ability to produce warheads for new nuclear systems. NASA, for one, requires new warheads to be produced, but there's a limit to how many of these can be produced. India and Pakistan, when it comes to AI and strategic stability, are also a bit of a knowledge gap. There's been some work done into China and um, the US, but not so much India and Pakistan. And it could have wider implications for nuclear force structure. So what have they said about it? I have some direct quotes on the next slide, so I'll breeze through this one quite quickly. India, from the high governmental level down to military procurement, has expressed interest in using AI for national security purposes, including explicitly for nuclear operations. This has also been expressed by senior figures on both sides. Pakistan, as well, has um, expressed an interest in doing this, but is more circumspect about the way it describes AI and national security, potentially because they have considerably less funding in the area than India does. So these are the quotes from official sources. You're able to read them, but I'll also read out the salient points. One from the Ministry of Defence Artificial Intelligence Task Force report, which makes recommendations of making India a significant power of AI in nuclear warfare. The wording may be open to um, consideration, but it's interesting that they've been wi willing to publish this. Um, Bipin Rawat has expressed that India cannot be left behind in technological spending by China. And President Alvi of Pakistan has also expressed an interest in applying AI to national security. So we've established that there's a utility of application. In the top right, for example, um, this is an image taken by a synthetic aperture radar satellite similar to the one that India uses for weather reconnaissance. It can pick things out in any weather condition on the ground. This is especially useful for conventional operations, so maintaining border security, for example. There is an intent to apply, as demonstrated by senior officials on both sides. It's technologically feasible. Artificial intelligence has already been demonstrated to do these kind of things. But even if it weren't, the mere notion that it can challenge the survivability of nuclear weapons is concerning. There is financial support, especially on the Indian side. And again, it's useful for conventional operations. But a conventional missile also looks a lot like a nuclear missile. And conceivably, the technology could be used against both, either um, intentionally or unintentionally. So the pathway to crisis, how do I see this occurring? India will likely, in the short term, develop rudimentary artificial intelligence and decision support tools to help with the conventional challenges that it faces. It's already doing this in Fitbit-style sensors for its troops as they're patrolling at night. Artificial intelligence can recognize something moving and then alert the soldier. These tools, effective or not, will heighten Pakistan's concern over the concealment and survivability of its conventional forces. And inevitably, as the technology progresses, somebody will have the idea of, well, if we can track surface-to-air missiles, what about the other missiles, the nuclear missiles, that Pakistan uses for its deterrence? Aware of this research, Pakistan's decision makers, given the long-term nature of nuclear procurement, will have to factor this into their procurement of new nuclear systems and their development of doctrine and concepts. And then these factors may then compound a subsequent crisis. The image in the bottom right is from Frontex, and Frontex already uses a similar kind of technology for tracking shipping that may or may not be illicit. So what does this mean? If artificial intelligence is going to undermine the concealment and survivability of nuclear systems, it could require these actors to make changes to their nuclear force tactics, trainings, and procedures, including maybe mixing nuclear and conventional systems. The NASA, for example, could be conventional warhead equipped or nuclear warhead equipped. There could be changes to nuclear force structure. On Pakistan's side, the procurement of the Baba 3 sea launch cruise missile, for example, may be one way of getting around the concealment issue. There could be changes to release authority. With putting nuclear weapons on submarines, you suddenly have to start thinking about different challenges to your nuclear command and control structure. There could be challenges to the credibility of no first use in Pakistan's eyes. 
is there a trend towards growing counterforce desire on the Indian side? It's a debate that's um, going on in academic circles. And there could be changes to the rational thinking of decision makers, and it could alter deterrence. All of this adds up to the question of, is there going to be more or less stability? And as Dr. Johnson said earlier, I'm also of the opinion that the trend is downwards towards more instability and unstable actions as opposed to stability, although there could be actions that are stabilizing that could fall out of this. And what happens next? You can attack the specific capability. So in a crisis, you could try and cyber your way into their machine learning algorithms, throwing as many buzzwords in as possible. You could try and attack the system itself, the intelligence collection, using satellites to dazzle recon uh, lasers to dazzle reconnaissance satellites. You can defend against the system through deception, mitigation, moving things around faster to try and beat the rate of intelligence refresh. You could look to assistance from allies. Pakistan may be discussing with China ways of getting around this concealment problem because they will both face the same challenge. There could be mutual agreements. Pakistan and India already share lists of their nuclear sites. Um, and one could conceive that maybe India may limit the orbital transits of its weather satellites to give Pakistan's... Uh, OK, that's my time up. But again, the most concerning thing to fall out of this would be the introduction of AI systems before they have been validated, before they have been verified, because then there may be con concerning um, implications for decision making, the information that goes up to the people making decisions during a crisis. And I'm happy to take any more specific or more general questions at the end of the panel. Thank you. And our fourth and final speaker is uh, Shunak, who I believe is also from King's College London. Yes, that's correct. Uh, let me just try this. Oh, okay. Uh, hi, uh, Shonak. Uh, I am a PhD fellow at King's College uh, London. Good afternoon. As a last speaker on the panel, my job uh, is to kind of wrap things up, and I have very little to add on to what probably has been uh, discussed. Uh, first of all, uh, South Asia presents a unique template to examine issues of uh, deterrence, nuclear proliferation, and regional nuclear dynamics simultaneously. And central to the process is India, not because I come from there, but because of four quick points. First, it is a rising power. Two, it has been partially accommodated in the non-proliferation order. Three, it has a malleable nuclear doctrine. And four, it demonstrates steady nuclear and conventional modernization. And essentially what my presentation does is to point some interesting trends, particularly over the last five years, and try to make sense of the way things might unfold and what does this mean. Now, to begin with a very bird's eye overview of uh, South Asia, the region itself spawned the second nuclear age with the consecutive Indian and Pakistani nuclear tests of 1998. And uh, since the last couple of years, uh, India has gained membership to the key uh, technology control regimes, beginning with the missile technology control regime in 2016, Wassenaar arrangement in 2017, and the Australia group in 2018. It is still vying for a membership to the nuclear suppliers group, but it has an NSG waiver already thanks to the india USA civilian nuclear agreement of 2008. Now, coming to the security dimension, the general understanding of South Asian security has largely been informed by the idea that uh, stability exists at the strategy, that is the nuclear level, with instability at the um, tactical or subconventional levels. And this is expressed as a stability-instability paradox. But the moot point that I try to raise is that is this changing due to technological, political, and structural developments? Now, before we delve further, it is important to understand uh, two caveats, which is uh, the South Asian understanding of nuclear issues is different than the notions, than the conventional nuclear notions, which are largely derived from Western settings, and this manifests differently. And although maybe not in principle, and the South Asian uh, strategic stability 
Bees, uh, beyond the India-Pakistan dynamics, it is also uh, a function of two other key competitive relations, India and China, and at the global level, China and USA. And this we'll see uh, later in the presentation too. Now, there are some defining characteristics of South Asia, uh, which is the political geography means that unlike the USSR and USA dyad, there is India and Pakistan being neighbors. Uh, this physical proximity, uh, proximity obliterates literally any time window, and the nuclear fallout would potentially affect both countries. And deterrence here is distinguished by the interlinkage between subconventional, conventional, and strategic levels. So in the case of a crisis, what would happen is that uh, if you see uh, the pictures, which is a 2008 Mumbai uh, terrorist attack, uh, in response, India might order a limited uh, combined arms um, ingress in Pakistan, which is known as the Cold State Doctrine, and the Pakistan, in response, threatens to use a tactical nuclear weapons, for which India, again, moves to the ballistic missile defense shield. So this is the way that the scenario is developing. There is uh, the Indian uh, doctrine, sorry, the Indian uh, nuclear uh, doctrine is malleable. It is kind of almost no first use because it also covers chemical and biological weapons. There is a debate between counter value and counter force in academic circles. Uh, although there is very little tangible evidence of the shift and uh, to, uh, to, um, to make a uh, critical point is that this has been entirely inferred by academics. Nowhere the doctrine mentions about counter force or counter value targeting. It talks about uh, assured massive retaliation. What does that mean is left open to interpretation. Uh, some of the persisting features of Indian security planning is that a lot of policy debate is there, and also there is ambiguity which is shaped by exigencies and individuals, and due to the lack of official policy declarations and the lack of a systematic declassification of archives, often analysts are uh, left to read between the lines. So for instance, uh, with the publication of this book, Choices, by uh, a retired National Security Advisor, Shiv Shankar Menon, this actually generated the debate about the shift between counterforce and counter value targeting. Uh, my colleagues here have spoken about uh, the cold stir doctrine. Uh, for a long time, Cold State was not officially acknowledged. There were lots of acknowledgement and dismissals, uh, but in 2017, it has been finally acknowledged by the Army, and in 2018, that is last year, the Army conducted exercise, and in the press release, it said, quote, unquote, it is ready to fight in a battle space contaminated by nukes. So, that is the situation at the moment, and uh, two other factors, which is there is a significant time lag between articulation of interests, demonstration of capabilities, and induction into force structures, and Indian strategic planning is primarily driven by China, but it also impacts Pakistan. Now, having presented this situational analysis, I move to the crucial developments which have been taking place over the last few years. Uh, it was widely reported in the international media about uh, the acquisition of nuclear triad by India. The first vehicle, the Orighat, was launched in 2016, and it com completed its deterrence patrol in 2018. The second one, Orighat, has been launched in 2017 and is expected to uh, complete the deterrence patrol sometime this year. The total fleet is envisaged of four vehicles. Uh, by the way, due to the dynamics of the Indo-Pacific and the Quad, the Indian Navy is undergoing significant expansion, whereby, whereby plans for six nuclear attack crafts or SSNs have been approved. In uh, less than three months ago, on 27 March, India conducted the anti-satellite test. As we all know, it was a direct ascent kinetic kill asset, and this has direct implications for the ballistic missile uh, defense architecture. Uh, the Indian BMD architecture consists of in, an indigenous component, but it is also supported by foreign components from US, Israel, and Russia. And most significantly, the Russian S-400 has been uh, 
formalized. The acquisition of the S-400 has been formalized and delivery is set to commence from October next year. Now, moving over to the other critical aspects relating mostly to the political and the policy uh, spheres. We have seen the cross-border strikes, mostly special force raids and air strikes. And uh, my point is that debates may revolve around the exact effect of these practices and their technicalities. But if one studies the policy trajectory and the messaging, then there seems to be a growing evidence of a greater appreciation in New Delhi concerning the role of force in international relations without resorting to a full-fledged conventional conflict. And this has two points. First, operationally, this is facilitated by a greater role of special forces and precision munitions. And two, this is reflective of a broader shift from the traditional pacifist stance of Indian foreign policy. And this brings me to my next point, which is that the domestic dimension is marked by emergence of new political constituencies and novel tendencies. And the ramifications are still unfolding. When I submitted this abstract, India was going to the polls, and as we all know, the current dispensation has been re-elected with an expanded mandate, and there has been interesting developments in India's national security architecture. And uh, I would like to discuss this in greater detail in the Q&A uh, due to the time limit. Uh, so finally, what does all these disparate strands mean for the issues of regional nuclear dynamics and deterrence? My sense is that existing categories and concepts need to be revisited and revised. So for instance, uh, at the conceptual level, I find that the issues of tailored deterrence and limited war need to be looked into as to the technological interventions like precision weapons and hypersonic glide vehicles. In the academic literature, we need greater engagement on the interconnection between security, foreign policy, and domestic politics. And probably, we might need to move beyond traditional theories of international relations. So for instance, just to think aloud, I find the notions of strategic triangle from game theory and advocacy coalition framework from pub public policy to be of potential utility in this context. Uh, I'll just conclude by saying that academics have debated about the ongoing transition, but the point is to contextualize and evaluate it in a holistic manner, which broadens the understanding of the region, but also widens the empirical and conceptual foundations of deterrence and proliferation itself. Thank you.